Okay, everything is ready. Well, I thank you very much. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音> This is time. Time is up for we start. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, my name is Yang Jian. Uh, according to the uh, the arrangement of the organizer, uh, in next session, that's the session three. That's also the today's last session and also the last session of this uh, symposium. Um, I'm honored to be the moderator of this session. Uh, in this session, originally there will be uh, six speakers, uh, but in, uh, the, the 
Professor Fu Kunchen from Shanghai Jiao Tong University because he had the, the conflict scheduled. He could not uh, participate in our uh, the, the, the symposium. So the first speaker uh, is uh, Haoji Jilson uh, from the University of Kuala He will give us a uh, uh, talk about the importance of the fish market for the Icelandic value chain of the, the mussel fish. Uh, welcome. Now this one. Okay. You can have uh, more than 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, less than, not exceed 20 minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you just give me a wink. Tell me. <laughs> Hello. Uh, it's nice to be here. I want to thank the organizers and the moderator and the guests for being able to be here and tell you a bit about our research. It's a research of, of my colleagues and that the, my colleagues and I are doing on the value chain of cod and have been doing for almost a decade, been working on that. So I'll be telling you a bit about that. For this one, the role of the fish markets in the Icelandic value chain of cod, uh, it's Ómundur Knudsson at the University of Akureyri, Ólafur Klemensson at the Central Bank of Iceland, and me, Helgi Jason, uh, we have been working on, on this part of the research. I'm just going to tell you a bit about the research and, and the fish markets and how they operate here in Iceland. And uh, I will be just mentioning those things that you see here, the fish markets, the allocation of fish to the markets. There has been a consolidation and development, of course, since they were established, and talk a bit about the development of the value chain importance, and probably end with uh, a conclusion from, from us. I put, I started, decided to start with this, that this is the way that, that we can source fish here in, in Iceland, the wet fish, the demersal wet fish, and we could do it through the auction, the fish markets that we have. Uh, a lot is through the direct sales contracts, or a bit is, is through direct sales contracts between fishing vessels and processors themselves. But most, is, most of it is sourced ver from vertically integrated companies, uh, having their own vessels and then processing themselves and, and, and selling them. Uh, over the years, this group, the three of us, and also Dadimar Christofferson at the University of Iceland has also been uh, with us. We've been looking at the value chain of cod in Iceland, or the Icelandic value chain of cod. About the uh, fish markets, they were established in 1986 here in Iceland. Uh, that, the first one was established then. And, and after that, more and more were established. And now we have a fish markets data center limited, a company that is owned by 15 independent fish markets uh, that run the, the fish market, the virtual fish market here in Iceland. And it's computerized as you, can, as you see there. We are using the Dutch auction type, the clock, where you start and, and then you stop, similar to the tulips in Holland. So, as you see there, here we have 15 independent fish markets, um, a lot of vessels, both small and, and large, up to a thousand vessels are, are on the auction market, and there are 30 landing places that all around Iceland where they can land the vessels, and then the fish will be transported to the processor that has bought it. In the first year, uh, it started with 22,000 tons, the fish market, but went up to 100,000 tons very, 
very soon, uh, just after five years. It has been fluctuating a bit, but it's around 89,000 tons on the average since uh, 2000 that we have on this market. And the cod is the most important species, uh, both in value and also in volume. And um, as you can see, in the last 30 years, and it has been falling in importance from nearly half of all fish in the volume terms to 40%. And at the same time, the importance of hot dog has been fluctuating, uh, depending on how much hot dog we can fish. But um, it has been rising but changing. I think I have a picture here showing this. But you can see the relative share of the main species on the fish market. Uh, we see that the cod is coming from in 2000, 2004, and up to 2010, 2013, this one. It has been fluctuating a bit, as you can see, from 45% down to 33 and up to 40. The haddock at the same time has has been changing also. It, there has been those similar but opposite fluctuations, you could say, in a way. And then we have safe catfish and other species. If we look at the share of the total landings that are allocated to the fish markets in volume, uh, you could see that uh, catfish is almost half, almost 50, almost half of the catfish that is landed is on the markets. Uh, about 34% in 2010-13 is the hot dog. The cod has slightly been going down from 19% to 17 over these years from 2000. So you see that the, most of the catfish is, or half of the catfish catch is really sold in the market. If we look at how the cod is allocated between different modes of processing, um, we really just looked at the land processing not frozen at sea or, or processed at sea, because that was the part that we were looking at. But there are uh, four ways or four channels that, that we can see the cod go to processing. It's similar to what we saw for the markets. It's internally with the vertically integrated companies uh, to land-based processing, then the fish markets and mostly they are uh, the catch there or, or, or the volume there is sold for land-based processing through di direct sales to independent processors and also then it's frozen at sea and here we have some numbers uh, for that what you see here uh, the share of cod to the fish markets has been nearly constant um, I think it's better just to look at this. Uh, it's, here we see how it's really allocated, the, the cut in percentage to fish markets, uh, to the companies and internal sales and, and frozen at sea. And we see that almost 70%, the line here, is uh, internal sales of vertically integrated companies, the big companies that are not selling the fish uh, on the market, but using it and processing it themselves. Uh, the, then we have the fish markets here, and we can say there are some slight, uh, alter, uh, some, some slight differences between the years, but we are now almost down to what, 40 percent. And the allocation of cod to different processing we could see the differences. The noticeably uh, interesting part is the green line here, where we can see the fresh fish, the sales of the or use of the fresh fish uh, has been really increasing from uh, almost nothing in 1992 95, and we are now up to 14%. And this is because of the things that have been happening. Uh, partly because of the establishment of the fish markets and also because of the possibility of 
of selling uh, f fresh fish fillets uh, to the countries around us. If you look at the fish market prices versus the internal sales price, uh, there is a difference. This is a bit complicated because we have an internal sales price, we have the market price for the auctions, and then we have um, internal sales price for the vertically integrated companies, mainly for paying the seamen or the sailors. Um, so the difference is shown here. Um, the difference is partly due probably to the use of the quota, transport, logistics, and other things, and, and um, uh, a bit, uh, you, could, you could say, not, not everybody is, agrees on uh, the difference here. Is the time for me there? Okay. It's okay, okay, yeah. We have uh, seen consolidation there, a few but larger buyers. Uh, we had in the 2000, we had buyers of all species that bought more than 50 tons in the market. We had uh, over 200 uh, companies or actors doing that, but it's been down to 140 in, in 2012. So there is a, a, a change there. The vertically integrated companies are they are very active on the fish market. They are selling off the species that they are not using, buying at sometimes fish or cod in the size that they need and even selling the sizes that they don't want to process. So they are getting more active on the market. So here you see the difference from 2000 to 2012. Uh, these are the integrated companies from 33% to 25%. In number, if you look at the 75% over 70, that buy over 75%, it's 41 companies in 2000 and down to 16 in 2012. So it's a great difference there. But as I said, the important thing for us here has been the export of uh, fresh cod fillets. That's really what has uh, increased the value for, for the Icelanders that you see here. And you see on the average of 14% of the total catch of cod has been allocated to fresh processing in the last four years, but it's generated around one fourth of the export value for all cod products. So if you remember the green line that I showed you going from 1% to about 14%, uh, that's really the important part that has been happening in the value chain there. So, uh, looking at this, you see the volumes in tons since the blue one and the percentage of exported cod in value for the fresh cod fillets, and you can see, see the changes there. The yield has something that you have to look at, and also uh, you have to look at the value added, the gross value added of the things. Um, you could say that the Icelandic fishing industry really caught the opportunity uh, that came in the late 1990s when uh, the demand for the fresh cod products increased rapidly. And since then, we have been trying to find ways of, of making, being able to sell it abroad and to, to uh, get more from that. The difference you see here is the difference of prices of fresh versus uh, frozen cod. As you can see here, you have fresh chilled cod in kilos in, in pounds, in here, the blue one. And this is the frozen cod fillets in pounds here. You see it's almost the same over, over here. The trend line is, is very stable there. But we have a, a rise, high rise here in the fresh chilled cod. And the last one of these pictures that I'm showing you uh, 
could see the price of the fresh cod fillets in, in pounds, value added, and then the export price of all ground fish here. Uh, the green columns are the index of export price of ground fish that you have here. And then the export price of fresh cod fillets on the left axis is here, and the gross value added here. We, um, the research that we have been doing, it has been in many parts. Uh, in one part of the research, we sent out a survey, nine questions in 2010 and then 2013, to 15 of the biggest processing companies, uh, asking them about what was the most important thing about doing business with the fish markets. And this is, uh, as you can see here, it's the rank there is a slight difference from 2010 to 2013, um, probably more just something to look at than, than to use, but freshness is deemed to be the most important part now. Access to the wet fish or to the fish is the second, that these were in the first and the second part, and then selection of species and other things. We have also we also done a research talking to 17 managers of companies, uh, qualitative uh, research, asking them about uh, their views on the management system, quota management system, or fisheries management system, and the fish markets and others, and we have been using that in, in the things that we, we are working on. And this is an excerpt from an unpublished paper by Knudson, Dadimar Christofferson of the Uni University of Iceland and, and me that we are waiting for publication on. And here we see the importance of the fish markets uh, when we look at that. Firstly, they provide a stable flow of raw material to many small processors creating low entry barriers for entrepreneurs in fish processing. So that would be the first one. Secondly, they provide larger companies with opportunities to even out short-run catch variations, for example, in species and also in size, because size is of great importance to the bigger companies. And thirdly, they serve as a channel for bycatch species and undersized fish, allowing small quantities from many suppliers to be bought by a few specialized processors. So these are the three things that we find most important uh, of the fish market, because this means that the smaller companies can really compete on their uh, own basis. They can choose how to compete, but do not have to copy the bigger companies or, or, or work as they do. They can work in species that the others are not working in and finding customers. So the last one, these are the conclusions. I think the former PowerPoint slide was even better, but uh, th these are the important parts. The fish markets are primary in delivering cod and other species for fresh product processing, and uh, the fish pro the products generate higher prices, higher margins, and they link together uh, this fishermen and also the markets. Uh, meaning that the companies are more marketing driven than before, not catch driven, but marketing driven. It's the stability for the producers, transparency of price, the pressure for product development, really, really high pressure for product development, getting more out of each fish or kilo. And then we have the consolidation and it helps the industry to be flexible. So. Thank you very much. That's it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gaston. Uh, the next speaker will be the uh, uh, Associate Professor Zhou Lele. She came from the Shanghai Ocean University. Uh, she will bring us about her uh, uh, comparative study <laughs> about the fishery uh, uh, management between the Arctic and the, the ocean around the Antarctic. Is that right? Yeah. Please. Thank you. 
So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for the opportunity to give the presentation uh, in Iceland. And also my topic for presentation is a comparative study between Antarctic and Arctic fisheries management region. Maybe you will have the big question, why a comparative study between Antarctic and Arctic, which are at the opposite end of the Earth? So first I will say something about the comparability of Antarctic and also Arctic in terms of the fisheries management. I give some reasons. The first one, the ice-covered areas, naturally and politically. I think that therefore, naturally, it's quite understandable. But for this politically, for Antarctic, you know that uh, the claims for the sovereignty over Antarctic are all frozen. So this is uh, also the politically ice-covered areas. And also for the Arctic Ocean or the Arctic waters, um, I think that's uh, because the Arctic Ocean or Arctic, uh, Arctic Ocean is almost locked by the Arctic state's land. So this is something, and also there is not much involvement of the non-Arctic states in Arctic Ocean in terms of the fisheries management. So I prefer to say that both of the Antarctic and Arctic are the ice-covered areas naturally and also politically. And also second, uh, due to its very specific geographical locations, the environment or maybe the existence of Antarctic and Arctic are very fragile, which means easy to be attacked and also difficult to recover, so very uh, fragile. And also Antarctic and also Arctic waters suffer some similar fishes management challenges. I just to give some examples for, uh, with the enhanced accessibility of Antarctic and also Arctic, which means that there are more human activities and also the impact of human activities will exert the great intention, uh, attention on the marine living resources conservation. And also, maybe I will also give uh, the, uh, the, another example about uh, the dilemma, the dilemma between conservation and also exploitation. And I think that Antarctic waters and also Arctic waters also suffer from this dilemma. So I, I, I just think that there are some grounds for the comparability between Antarctic and also Arctic in the fisheries management. So now then we will come to here. We will uh, say something about the challenges which are specific to Antarctic and also Arctic uh, fisheries management. Why I just want to elaborate on the challenges? Because I want to come up with some remedies for those challenges. And also these remedies are inspired by the counterparts, which means that the Arctic remedy from Antarctic experience, Antarctic remedy from Arctic kind of uh, enlightenment. So first, I will just to mention something about the challenges which are specific for Arctic fisheries management. The first one I listed is about fragmentary fisheries management, because I have mentioned that Arctic Ocean is locked, almost locked by the Arctic state land and also which fall under control of the Arctic states. So, and also each Arctic state will have their specific, unique fisheries system, fisheries management system, and which makes it uh, quite a piece of fragmentary work for the fisheries management. And also the second, I say that there is a lack of universal regional fisheries management organization and also agreement at Arctic waters. Uh, I should have to say that at the Arctic waters, currently there are some regional fisheries management organizations, but they suffer from some drawbacks. Maybe there are some overlap, or maybe there are some blind spots for their fisheries management uh, fields or areas. And also then, uh, for, the, for the fisheries agreement, also there is no universal fisheries agreement. And I have to also to say that at the Arctic waters, there are some uh, agreements among the Arctic states, but I think that most of them are the bilateral agreements, which means that they don't cover all the Arctic waters. So which also just means that the lack of universal regional fisheries management organization and agreement uh, make the f Arctic fisheries management quite fragmentary. And also the third, I just mentioned about the non-Arctic states, because at the Arctic waters, there are some high seas, and also with the, how to say, the very promising prospects of Arctic fisheries in the future. Uh, 
there will be possibly some conflicts between Arctic states and also non-Arctic states for the access to the fishes resources at the Arctic waters. So this is also a kind of very specific challenge that maybe the, in the Arctic waters. And also the next one, I just want to mention about the dynamics of Arctic fishes development. With the global warming, the kind of composition of the fish stocks and also the quantities and also maybe the distribution are quite unpredictable. But I think that to most fishes researchers, they just think that there is a very promising future for the Arctic fishes. Maybe there will be some formation of the new fishing ground at the Arctic waters. So it's quite uh, promising. But you see that this is quite unpredictable because no one can just tell the exact uh, result. So the dynamics of the Arctic fishes development also bring some challenge for the Arctic fishes management. Then the next one, the interference of the IUU. This is uh, illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. Of course, yeah, many waters suffer from IUU. And also then, the Arctic fishes uh, is also suffer from the IUU. So this is some of the challenges that are specific for the Arctic fisheries management. Then I will just to see that how the Arctic, uh, sorry, Antarctic fisheries management can shed light on the Arctic. The first one I want to mention about the Kamala. So the first one I, I just read it, yeah, the Kamala as a consistent fisheries management system. Here this Kamala refers to the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Here I refer to the convention. This convention is quite consistent uh, at the Antarctic waters, which means that it serves as a Bible for the Antarctic fishes management. And I think that it will make the easy job for Kamala to manage the fishes issues at Antarctic, because this is a universal one. And uh, I think that what the Arctic can learn from Antarctic in the terms of Kamala which means that we should call for the more collaborations between or among the Arctic, Arctic states. This is quite important. Try to make a kind of universal, uh, universal um, fisheries management system. If not the universal, I, 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 I think that's the most ideal situation that the universal uh, fisheries management system, but it's quite difficult. But anyway, the, some more bilateral agreements or maybe more multilateral management. And also then the second, Kamala as a universal uh, regional fisheries management organization. And also here, this Kamala, I refer to the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Uh, also, yeah, you know that this is a universal uh, fisheries management organization at the Antarctic waters. And uh, here I just to give some questions, because you see that at an at the Arctic waters, there is no universal fishes regional, uh, sorry, regional fishes management organization. And maybe in the future, there are some options. Just for my opinion, maybe how about the refunctioning? Because I mentioned that currently there are some regional fishes management organization at the adjacent seas of the Arctic waters, Arctic Ocean. And also there are some organizations at the uh, Arctic Ocean. And I think that maybe in the near future, there will be some possibility for the extension of their function for those organizations. Maybe they can cover the Arctic waters. Who, who knows, yeah? And also then the second option, maybe I will just to mention something about the Arctic Council. In the year of, of course, yeah, Arctic Council is kind of uh, serves as an intergovernmental forum, uh, which is quite important at the Arctic, what, uh, Arctic areas. But you see that... Uh, in the year of 2007, at the ministerial conference, the Arctic Council made a, a declaration. They say that they will not get themselves involved in the fishes management issues at Arctic. But of course, yeah, uh, with the promising future of the uh, Arctic fishes development, maybe the Arctic Council will get themselves involved in the fishes management issues. But currently, I think that Arctic Council lacks some professional background and also lack some authority to be involved in the Arctic fisheries management. Uh, but I think that maybe also in the near future, there will be some possibility of restructuring, refunctioning of Arctic Council to take up the kind of mission of the Arctic fisheries management. And also something about recreation, that means uh, maybe there are also some possibility 
of giving rise to a very brand new fishes management organization, which will cover all the Arctic waters. It will be very, also very ideal idea. So you see that there are some options, but no one can just to tell which will be the best one, or maybe there are other options. This is also just my thinking about this one. And also I mentioned something about the advanced fisheries management philosophies from Antarctic to Arctic. Uh, I just give two examples. Uh, Eco-based fisheries management and a precautionary approach are, the very, are very typical of the advancement of Kamala. Uh, I think that yeah, Kamala is internationally recognized and also sometimes thanks to these two very advanced fisheries management philosophies. But you see that eco-based fisheries management value uh, quite a lot about the unity or the harmonia of one ecosystem, which demands a kind of management going beyond the political, political boundaries. I think this is quite difficult to function in the Arctic waters. I mentioned that because the Arctic uh, Ocean fall under the control of the Arctic states. If you want to excite the fisheries management, which go beyond the political boundaries, which means that you have to be highly being cooperative. So it's also maybe a, a little bit uh, difficult. And also for this precautionary approach, that means some conservative measures should be there before the disasters are brought about. I think that this is quite important to the Arctic fisheries management because now at the Arctic Ocean, maybe there is no very large-scale commercial fishing activities. But in the near future, there will be some possibilities. So before the disaster to the system are brought about, we have to take some precautionary approach at the Arctic Oceans to just to make guarantee of the sustainability of the fishes resources in Arctic waters. Now, and also in the next one, I think that the timely and dynamic fisheries management measures from Antarctic, it is also very impressive. Uh, I say that being timely and also dynamic by nature for the Antarctic fisheries management measures, this is very impressive. I will also give the example. Uh, I think that yeah, in the more than 30 years of development of Kamala, uh, they just to uh, in, uh, they just to establish numerous a bundle of fishes conservative measures. For example, the gear that means the fishing tools. And if you check the Kamala website, you can find that there are the detailed regulations, the different regulations which are made at the different years about the gear regulations. Which means that uh, because the Kamala will have the annual conference, and also where they will just to talk about how to update their conservative measures. So this is quite timely and also very dynamic uh, because the Arctic fisheries development is also of dynamic nature. So I think that maybe the Arctic also can learn a lot from the Antarctic fisheries management experience. And then the next one, being very cooperative with outsiders. Uh, what I just want to mean that uh, I will also give you some examples. Kamala and also the United Nations once were the competitor for being the exact body for the Antarctic Oceans. But of course, yeah, Kamala is a winner. Kamala is a winner. But then you see that uh, uh, we can just to find many examples for being in the very cooperative relationship between Kamala and also United Nations. Because many fisheries agreements and also kind of regulations, policies from United Nations are also applied to the Antarctic Oceans, Southern Oceans. And uh, something like about uh, the enhancement of international cooperation at the UNCLOS is also quite uh, popular at the Kamala areas. And also, I think that maybe, so you see that uh, Kamala has a very good cooperation relationship with the United Nations. And also, I will just to give you also another example about, uh, for this. Uh, in light of the CITES, CITES, this is a convention for the conservation of endangered species. And also then, the Kamala just to uh, uh, give kind of requirements for the, how to say, uh, because they want to combat for the IUU, for the truce fish at uh, Antarctic waters. And what they do, they just to cooperate with, uh, uh, with uh, import countries or export countries. Those countries which are involved in the truce fish trading, they have to have 
the kind of certificate of legal origin of the truth face. So you, you can just to see that Kamala is always ready to cooperate with the outsiders, just something like the scientists and also the, the many agreements or the regulations about the first management from United Nations. And also there are many examples. I just want to name some of them. And then you can just, to, I, I will just move on to the next one about the challenges for Antarctic fisheries management. And uh, of course, yeah, Antarctic fisheries management suffer from some drawbacks. The first one, because of the frozen of the claims for sovereignty. So there is no kind of uh, coastal states at the, at, at the Antarctic areas, which means that uh, the Kamala has to take up the responsibilities which the coastal states should have taken up. So this is something quite new, because for this kind of international organization, there is no kind of formal experience that uh, it can learn from. So this is quite a brand new, brand new exploration for the Kamala. And then the second, I think that's the lack of control over the third party. This is also very, uh, very understandable. And also the next one, the unfeasibilities of the precautionary approach at the Antarctic Fish, uh, Antarctic waters. I have mentioned that the precautionary approach is quite typical of the advancement of the fisheries management philosophies at Antarctic, but the, now they suffer from the unfeasibility, unfeasibility of the precautionary approach, because there are more human activities uh, through the Antarctic areas. Then if they want to excite the precautionary approach, this is quite beyond themselves. And then we can just to see that uh, what Arctic fisheries management experience can shed light on Antarctic. First one I want to mention about the fisheries management practice of Arctic states. And just as this gentleman has mentioned that, you see that uh, for some Arctic states, the fishing industry is something like the polar industry for those countries. So it's quite important for these countries. And they have got much brilliant and a very intelligent experience in the fisheries management. For example, in Norway, they have the very systematic and a very brilliant uh, kind of set of the fisheries policies and the regulations. And also for Canada, they have got the Emerging Fishing Act, which means I think that which can be applied, uh, applied to the Arctic fisheries, because this is for new emerging fishing. And also for uh, United States, they have got the ban at the fishing at the Barents Sea, uh, not Barents, sorry, the Berlin Sea. So you, you can just to see that there are so much experience that uh, uh, maybe Kamala can learn from the coastal states of the Arctic Ocean. And also then the second, supervision of the international organizations. I also want to give just to the, the, the very brief uh, example. Uh, most, the, the, all the Arctic states, they ratified the fish stock, fish stocks agreement. And also at the consultations and also the uh, review conference of this fish stocks agreement, they will keep a monitoring eye on the processing on the kind of uh, Arctic fishes. Because if there are something wrong, they will just to try to criticize or just to get some supervision and monitoring or maybe suggestions. And also then the next one is the fishes management practice of regional fishes management organization. And I, I don't know whether you have heard about this NEFC, that is Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Organization. It has accumulated much experience in the Arctic, in, in the fisheries management, because this organization covers not only the adjacent, uh, adjacent sea of the Arctic waters, and also some Arctic waters. Yeah, it is, its experience are quite brilliant, but I don't have enough time to just to elaborate on. Then the next one, the bi- or the multi multilateral fisheries management agreements among the Arctic states. I also just think that one of the very successful uh, regional, uh, the, the let, bi, uh, bilateral fisheries agreement is between Norway and also Russia. This is the Norway-Russian Joint Fisheries Commission. Also, it's quite successful operated. And I think that to some extent, it makes some contribution to the successful de uh, delimitation in the Barents, Barents Sea. And also there are other achievements that this, uh, this commission has done, but I don't want to just to elaborate on. So I think that this is something that I want to just to talk about this quite briefly. So I think that if someone who is interested in this area, just to talk with me, uh, maybe after meeting or just with email. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Lily.
Uh, the next speaker is Assistant Professor from the University of Kuala uh, Professor uh, Val Thiessen. Uh, your piece for the okay. yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm uh, Rega Valtesson here from this university, and we have a small uh, institution called the Fisheries Science Center where I'm, I'm, I'm at. Now, I, I had this grand uh, uh, theme of my talk, the future growth of Arctic fisheries. Uh, I, of course, will not be able to answer all the questions. It's a very big, big question, but I will firstly tell you a little bit about what are the Arctic fishes, and then uh, what is predicted about the Arctic fisheries. And then I will go into the data and, and then look a little bit into what the data is actually showing now. Both regarding cuts and value creation, um, there are two things about fisheries. You might be thinking about making value, and then you might be thinking about food security, just to get as much protein as you possibly can. And then in the land, I will elaborate some on, on, on the certainties. Just so you show here, this is Iceland, and Iceland is right at the border of these two worlds, the Arctic and the, the, the cold temperate zone. And uh, this border actually moves both between seasons and uh, between years. So we experience uh, sometimes the Arctic, sometimes not. Now the Arctic fish species are really not so many, and they are from rather few groups. So in a way they are simple few species, and what, uh, what, what is also interesting is that it's almost the same species in the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. A little bit of a difference. In the Pacific, they have the Pacific cod, which is a different species from the, from the Atlantic cod. But more or less the same rule for these, uh, all of these species, and uh, they have been going back and forth. We just a few days ago, we had a, had a king crab found for the first time here in Iceland, for example. It's a Pacific species brought to, to northern Norway and Russia, and now somehow it managed to get here. But few species, we have the Gatois cod fishes, which is uh, the Atlantic cod, the most important fish in the world, of course, for us. We have the, both the Pacific cod and the, 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 the Alaska pollock, which is really a cod. It's very closely related to the cod. We have the Pacific salmonids, there are still many species, and then we have one species of salmon in the Atlantic. Then we have the red fishes, we have some species of crabs, like the king crab and the snow crab here. The snow crab is both in the Atlantic and the, and the Pacific. Uh, we have a few pelatics, actually very few, mostly just herring and capelin, and uh, polar cod as well, and a few other species. Not many, and really when you talk about the very important species, there are very few. Uh, what is the Arctic? It's, it's a difficult question. How do I define the Arctic? This is more or less what I define it, but I see very different definition in other places. We have the high Arctic, which really almost touches Iceland a little bit sometimes, but really not. We are in what's called low Arctic. And the southern part of Iceland would be in the temperate, cold temperate zone. But we are talking about this area here where, where, the, where the fisheries are. And note that many of these species, also very common in the low Arctic, they stretch to the south as well. We have cod in the North Sea and herring as well, but these are not Arctic conditions there. So be, be aware of these definitions. But these are the major players in the Arctic. When, I will tell you a little bit about the high Arctic here, which is uh, not really big. Now, the warming, what will happen with the warming? Uh, one of the most interesting predictions is, is this one here. What will happen in the ocean when the, when the warmings get on? And most of these predictions agree with this one. This one is by, by William Chung, which is uh, actually working in, in Vancouver now, but he's originally from Hong Kong, so it's a nice Chinese work there, and some of the, some of the other colleagues. But what they are predicting is that the north will benefit. The south, the extreme south, Antarctica probably as well, but it's the middle that will suffer. So we get warmer and the species uh, will move further north. The important species, which are mostly in the lower Arctic, they will move up to the higher Arctic. So that's the prediction. These northern countries, Norway, Greenland, Alaska, uh, Russia, and Iceland, and Canada will benefit from a warming trend. They will get more fish. 
And we have a lot of studies that looking at that. That well, there, someone stressed the, the, the uncertainties, but most of them will agree on that. Probably when we get warmer, there will be increase in the fish stocks in the north. So, what is the current data showing? First, if you look at the individual species, uh, this is Arctic fish species. We have here in, in one corner the cod fishes, which are really dominated by the, by the Alaska Pollock in the, in, the, in the Pacific, and the Atlantic cod in the Atlantic. Uh, we don't really see any clear trend there. These are the catses, by the way. Uh, other species are in the catses. These are, 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 are several species here, haddock, say, and Pacific cod. They don't really show any, any, any very clear trend. If you go into the pelagic, herring stocks and the, the capelin, we see a lot of fluctuations. And we see one thing here with the herring. We, have, we had a cooling trend here and the herring stock collapsed. But uh, we don't really see much later on. Not at least directly linked to, to, to climate. Crustaceans, we might see some link there. Crustaceans are mainly these two crab species, queen crab and the king crab, and the, the northern prawn, which is both fished in the, in the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we don't see any clear trend there. There is a decline in, in, the, in, in shrimp stocks in many places now, uh, which might be indirectly linked to the climate. It's mostly because the cod is eating the shrimp, but the cod might be increasing because of the climate. So uh, there, there is some indicators there. Then we look at the other groups, red fishes, salmons, other and flat fishes, we don't really see any clear trend. Perhaps with the exception of, of the Pacific salmonids, where, where some of them are expanding the range uh, up through the, the, the northern part of, of, of Alaska with, with a warming trend. So the, there is some indicator there that, that the, 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 the climate is now influencing the cats. Now, if we go from the species and we go to the, to the, to the areas, these are different areas in the Atlantic. I don't go so deeply into Pacific. It's, very, it's much more difficult to get the data separated to areas in the Pacific. But first, we look at the high Arctic. This is FAO area 18. The catch is there. You see the scale here is 200,000 tons. It's almost nothing. Uh, this is the area that's closed by ice, but might be getting some fish stocks if, it's, uh, if it gets much, much warmer. However, there has been a study showing that the actual catch data is probably wrong there. There's a study by, by Seller et al, which has been showing that the actual catch data you can see by FAO, etc., is just wrong. They are not reporting all the cats. Then we go to the Greenland. These are the, this is the high Arctic I'm looking at there. Greenland, uh, this is the northeastern Greenland. It's, it's, it's uh, northeast, northwestern from, from Iceland. And we see a lot of fluctuations, but these are mostly pelagic species going there and, and coming back. What you see there as a red line is the cats in tons, but the blue line is an indicator of the value. We use it here what's called cod equivalence, where you basically put every species at the same value of cod. So if some species has 10% of the value of the cod, then we, 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 we multiply the, the cats by 10%. To, so, so, so everything is at the same value level. But we see a lot of fluctuation there. These are mainly pelagic, which are low value going back and forth. Uh, Baffin Island, this is an, 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 an NAFO area. We see a little bit of an increase there uh, in, in Katsis, northern Katsis. So there could be some indicator of there that the, some of the species are expanding in this area. Eastern Greenland, we see a lot of fluctuations, but no clear trend, neither in, 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 in value or amount. Go a little bit low. This is a low Arctic, not a high Arctic. And we look at the trend in the Katsis. The Western Greenland catches has a lot of fluctuations, but it's not really going far. This is a lack of data here going down. But we see here, uh, this is an area, a time where they had much more cod. So there was more cod in Greenland, but despite the warming for the last 10 years, the cod catches like they were have not come back. In the Barrett Sea, we have uh, some increase in the catches in the later years, mainly linked to the, the, the cod. And this data expands to 2012, and we know it from, from the newer data and the news that the, the cod stock in the, in the Barents Sea is going 
at the roof. So there is some indicator there of, of, of an increase. Go to Canada, to, to Labrador, uh, the northern part there. We had a huge fishery for cod there. It collapsed, but it has not arrived back. Uh, in, the, in the Barrett Sea, uh, Eastern Barrett Sea, this is a Western Barrett Sea, this is the Eastern part. You can see the difference is always 200,000 tons between the lines, so the scale here is much bigger. We can also see a little bit of an increase if we kind of a squint, but it's not much really. But again, we know from new, newer data, it's not there, that it's, it's uh, increasing. Then we go still lower to lower, lower Arctic and the sub-Arctic. Iceland is there, for example. We have a lot of fluctuations, but no clear trend. The Newfoundland here, similar, a little bit of a decline. It's actually the cod, the shrimp going a little bit, and the, 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 the snow crab. Uh, and the problem is that the cod has not really gone up again, although there are positive signs. Faroe Islands, fluctuations, but no clear trend. Uh, the Norwegian Sea, fluctuations, but no clear trend. That is a, we are not seeing any actual cats any clear trend that the, the global warming we are talking about lately is having effects. Now, uh, the studies are really predicting that this will increase in these areas. But however, if we look at the data now, we are not seeing these clear trends. We might pick up individual areas and then and, and see, okay, that's warming happening there. The Barents Sea is the best example now. We have a expansion range of the cod there, and the cod stock there is bigger than ever. We have some little bit of a sign from Greenland that the cod might be coming back there. There is an increase there, but it has not yet reached the levels uh, before. And uh, I had the news from Newfoundland a few weeks ago that uh, there's actually good signs. We, we have, there is an increase, they are measuring more cod there than before, but they still have a long time to go. Uh, and here in Iceland, uh, we are seeing an increase in the cod stock, but it's, uh, everybody agrees almost that's not because of climate, it's because of management. We're allowing the cod to get bigger. So uh, if you take the whole picture, we don't really see any, any really, really clear trend. Note that I'm talking about the Arctic species. We have a mackerel invasion here in Iceland. Mackerel is not an invasion, not an Arctic species, a temperate species. So we have another like the, like the monkfish. The monkfish has been showing very clear trend in, in, in increasing. Usually it was only found in the south. Now it's found all around Iceland. Uh, that's also linked to the, to, the, to the climate. But then again, it's not really an Arctic species. It's a more southern species. So the question is, which I was, uh, frankly, when I was first going to look at this, I thought it was all the predictions are saying they are going to increase the, the fish stocks in the Arctic, but when you actually look at the data so far, it's not so clear, really. Other things like overfishing and recovery of the stocks, of course, mask the, the, the change. We, are, we, don't, we don't easily see if the stock is increasing because we are protecting it better or if, we are, if climate is having effect. So there are many factors playing on hand and making this picture more, more, more unclear. There are ecosystem complications in this. Uh, there were some models who did predict that the, the Alaska Pollock stock would increase by, by increasing climate. The Alaska Pollock is mostly found in the southern part of the Bering Sea. Uh, the models say, well, it will be more better temperature for the Pollock in a larger area if it gets warmer. Thanks, I'm almost done. But uh, it did happen. It got warmer, but the stock shrunk which was actually probably linked to, to the food. The food changed. They didn't have the same food bef as, as before. So although the temperature seemed to be good, the food was not good anymore. So uh, we have these ecosystem complications. And also we have a lot of uh, variation in the, in the, in the climate, uh, like the Atlantic Multidicatal Oscillation. That's about 60 years, people say that there is a fluctuation. And, uh, this might actually change things. And usually our data only goes back 50 years. We don't really know what's happened before that. that uh, we are not seeing the clear picture. So uh, we have to dig, dig deeper into this to, 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 to see what's going to happen. I actually think that, uh, I don't think it's wrong. It might actually increase the, uh, the stocks as the warm climate gets, gets uh, higher, warmer. But we are not just not seeing it yet. And uh, the, the picture looks... Uh, 
different. This is an excerpt from an article from 1932, where Bjarni Simonsson, a very, our first fishery scientist, was talking about there was so much mackerel around Iceland at that time. Now we have a lot of mackerel for the last three or four, four years, a lot of mackerel. And most people think it's never happened before, you know. Never happened before there was so much mackerel around Iceland. But it has, actually. If you look at the, 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 the data, the information, it, it is there. So the current increase in the mackerel might just be fluctuations instead of it's going up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Mr. Martinson. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Tom Perry. Uh, he came from the CAFF, that's Conservation of the Arctic Flora and the Fauna. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I, I must admit I feel a little bit out of, uh, out of place here because I'm the only person who's not going to mention anything to do with fish or marine governance. So I feel a little bit of a fish out of water. Mm. But, uh, and I appreciate that you've all spent uh, three hectic days to listen to myself as a second last speaker, so I'll try and be very short and sweet. So uh, I'm with uh, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, which is one of the six Arctic Council working groups, two of which happen to be located here in Ockerary, <coughs> which makes Ockerary the largest centre for the Arctic Council outside of our colleagues in Tromsø. So uh, I'm a geographer by trade, so I always like to start to show a map of what we're looking at. And uh, this red line here shows the uh, Arctic as defined by the CAF working group. So this defines the area within which we operate. And it's a huge area, something like 32 million square kilometers. Uh, of course, it has no legal meaning. It's just something to guide how we conduct our monitoring and assessment activities. So one of the key challenges that we see within the Arctic at the moment, or within the Arctic Council, is how do we take all of the data that's generated by all of the monitoring and assessment activities that happens across this huge area and make sure that that data gets in as short a time as possible to those people who are making decisions and need reliable, comprehensive data to develop the appropriate uh, responses to the changes that are happening in the Arctic. Uh, and part of the challenge of this as well is we have to ensure that the type of inf information we get is as comprehensive as possible. And what this requires is that we engage not just with ourselves within government agencies, but also that we engage with other sectors across the Arctic, be they indigenous organisations, non-Arctic countries, uh, industrial sectors and so on. We, uh, all of these various different uh, actors in the Arctic generate huge amounts of information, which by and large doesn't find its way into the monitoring and assessment products that the Arctic Council delivers to the Arctic Council ministers. So that is one of the big challenges that we face. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, sorry, and that, that sort of challenge is being recognised by the Arctic Council in recent ministerial recommendations that they've released. These are just two, perhaps, uh, two of the more relevant ones that came out last year would deal with the need to in mainstream Arctic biodiversity or to ensure that as the various different sectors start to develop and exploit the Arctic, that they incorporate biodiversity objectives into their planning and activities. But perhaps more controversially, that we also need to evaluate the services that the Arctic environment and its nature provides to us. And of course, any time you try to put a value on anything, that makes it very contentious and it can be very challenging. But nonetheless, this is a process of starting now, trying to understand what do the services provided by the Arctic's biodiversity and its nature mean to us, and what would their loss mean? What impacts would it have upon us? And how can this type of knowledge help support decision-making structures in the Arctic? Uh, of course, everything that uh, happens in the Arctic, as we're all aware here, has impacts far beyond what we consider Arctic areas. And the recent uh, accession of non-Arctic countries, such as China and other Asian countries, to the Arctic Council uh, reflects this increased interest. And it also provides an opportunity for us to leverage uh, this increased interest by uh, institutes and countries such as YEARS in what we're doing for our mutual environmental benefit. So what I'd like to talk about or provide an example of the type of biodiversity that links north and south together is not fish, but rather birds. 
because the countries such as China, which are no observers of the Arctic Council, have been asked to direct or focus their attentions or contributions to the Council's work via the, the activities of its working groups, such as CAF. And the, the first such, if you'd like, test uh, of how this can be operated or done is being conducted through the CAF working group through the issue of migratory birds. And this map that you show up here shows the flyways through which Arctic migratory birds migrate during their, uh, their life cycle. And as you can see, all these arrows and red numbers pointing down indicate the declines in populations along these flyways. And uh, as you can see, uh, they're all experienced very radical declines, but the East Asian Australasian flyway with a decline of almost 90% in populations is very alarming. So the question is, how do we cope and manage with this? Uh, because the Arctic countries within the Arctic area can do very comprehensive and effective conservation strategies and action plans, but unless they engage with countries or entities outside of the Arctic where these migratory birds spend part of their lifetime, then those conservation initiatives within the Arctic region will be less effective. So it's been chosen as a very useful model to try to demonstrate or build upon countries such as China, Singapore and Japan, how they can input and contribute productively to what we're doing in the Arctic Council. Uh, and that's a new initiative that we've just started and we're just starting to engage in discussions with uh, particularly Asian countries, how they can contribute to this. And uh, I, I'd just like to show one particular species because I, I didn't see too much about uh, species other than fish in the Congress so far. And uh, this is, uh, in many ways, a flagship species for that flyway. It's called the spoonbill sandpiper. And uh, this, unfortunately, is a species that's nearing extinction. So in the last 30 years, it's declined by almost 90%. And I think the latest figures uh, at the start of this field season now are there are only 400 individuals of these, this particular bird species left. And what's so important about this, or so worrying, is that we don't know what will happen to the ecosystems when such species slowly become extinct, what impacts or uh, effects will that have upon the nature upon which we depend. So this is just uh, uh, on the verge of extinction, and this is a, an interesting chart which I, I like to show because there's a sense of urgency with this, and this shows how they, they project that uh, the species will slowly go into extinction unless radical action is taken in the coming years. But th that population has reduced so dramatically that that's a, a challenge. So they, they expect that by 2020, if things continue as they are, then this particular bird will have left our planet for good. And uh, this bird is a very good example of the connection with China because one of its most important, or its most important stop oversight are the mud flats in the Yangtze River. And uh, that's an area that's subject to increasing reclamation, increasing industrialization, and so the habitats that support such uh, species is slowly, being, uh, slowly disappearing. So one of uh, the objects of our discussions with our uh, Chinese and uh, other Asian colleagues is how can we generate conservation impacts to develop some sort of network of protection both within the Arctic and outside the Arctic that can be conducive to helping ensure the survival of species such as this. Uh, so that was just a very short introduction to some of the connections that we have uh, with uh, the Chinese area of the world. And these are, it's a new uh, initiative within the Arctic Council because you've only China and Singapore and so on have only just recently and South Korea joined the Arctic Council. So slowly but surely their scientists are starting to engage with us and starting to contribute information to the monitoring programs within the Arctic Council so we can try and determine are these trends real uh, and can, can that added information and expertise help lead to some sort of conservation impact. One of the important steps in the Arctic Council to try and uh, build on this dialogue is uh, the first Arctic Biodiversity Congress which the Arctic Council has scheduled for later this December in Trondheim. And this is intended as a, a cross-sectoral con congress where we will engage with both industry, uh, academia, government sectors, but also with countries both inside and outside the Arctic Council to try and discuss how we can address these conservation issues. And uh, we're very much hoping that we'll get a, a good level of engagement with uh, non-Arctic countries in that process as well. So if any of our Chinese colleagues here are interested in this Congress, then please let me know and I'll provide you more information. <laughs> but that's, I'll keep it short and sweet because I think Rachel is anxious to 
get her talk over and done with too. So we can go back to the law of the sea. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tom. And the next speaker is Professor John Stone. As he came from the University of Kuroli, he she gave a talk about the rise of defense of the ocean. Thank the you. Ocean. If I can find it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. I have the dubious honor of being the final speaker, so I will follow Tom and attempt at least keep this short, if, uh, even if my slides are not nearly so pretty. Um, here we go. So this presentation comes about because I've been to a number of Arctic-themed uh, conferences, including Arctic Circle last year, and I listened to the plenary session on fishing with six representatives from various uh, Arctic uh, countries and non-Arctic countries, all men, of course, uh, and only one of them, uh, Jung Pen Lee from Costco, mentioned environmental responsibility. So it struck me that at a number of these conferences, the Chinese delegates have been extremely conscious of the vulnerability of the Arctic, the contents of the Arctic Ocean, and the vulnerability of Arctic populations. Now, maybe there's a lot of lip service in that, but I like to take it at face value. I think the Chinese are interested in the Arctic environment and interested in protecting it, um, which might encourage Tom uh, somewhat. somewhat. Now, what I'm going to talk about is a rather technical corner of international law. I'm going to try and present it without using any Latin, which is a challenge enough. Um, and I hope you'll bear with me, and I hope that you will find this at least faintly interesting. I've been gripped by this for at least uh, two years. Um, so my question is this. You can see on this map, um, this, this dark area in the middle is the Arctic Ocean high seas. It's the size of the Mediterranean. That's the area that, uh, that Zua was talking about earlier. Um, it's beyond the national jurisdiction of any state. Now, the continental shelf, that bit underneath, most of that's going to be claimed by Arctic states. Well, claimed is the word we don't like to use, will be uh, attached to the continental shelves of the coastal states, uh, with the exception of these two white sections. But that doesn't really matter. Um, because that section in the middle, that dark blue, will always be high seas. There's no way around that. It's high seas. It's a public good. Um, and there's lots of primary norms to protect that. Uh, part 12 of the Convention on Law of the Sea is about marine protection. And it's, it, there's, there's just a lot of law out there. But my question isn't about that law. My question is about, is about what happens if the Arctic states or flag states of shipping vessels violate that law? What if they don't meet their environmental obligations? So if they don't meet their environmental obligations, what can other states do? Now this goes back to the basis of international law is bilateral relations, that is state to state relations. So if Norway has a big gas explosion and it pollutes the Russian EEZ, Russia's an injured, Russia is an injured state, it can make a claim. But what about Iceland? What about China? What interests do they have? And that's what interests me. This area of high seas, if we have a shipping disaster, or if we have an oil and gas disaster, who has the power to bring the responsibility of the governing state? Who has the power to hold that state to account? And international law is not very good on this. So just to show you, this uh, is, uh, sorry, the previous map is Ron McNabb's from 2007. This is an illustration from Rothwell and Stevens, 2010, which I have scribbled on with no reverence whatsoever. Um, the green bits, or the, the lighter colored areas, that, those are the rights of the coastal states. I think this is not very controversial or complex. So you have rights in the territorial sea, which is sovereignty. Then you have rights to the continental shelf that go out past the 200 nautical miles into outer continental shelf. Exclusive economic zone above, that's the water column. And then on the top, you have navigation. The blue section is the rights of other states. These are resource rights. So the area beyond national jurisdiction, common heritage, pretty much irrelevant in the Arctic Ocean. Those little bits that are left are so many decades beyond any kind of economic uh, realization, if ever. High seas, as we heard, of course, all states have an interest in the resources in those. And states have a, fish, have a navigation right, right up to the coast of, uh, of, uh, of coastal states, including uh, to the territorial sea. So this is not very complicated. It's just law of the sea 101. Law of the sea 102. These are the rights that other states have. 
So I've expanded this because under Part 12 of the Convention on Law of the Sea and various other instruments, the other states, the blue states, have interests in the environment that reach right up to the coastline, right up to the baseline. So they have interest in how other states treat their exclusive economic zone. They have interest even in the territorial sea. They have environmental interests. But there's one thing between having an environmental interest or caring about something and it being a legal interest. That is having a right to invoke responsibility. I said I wouldn't use Latin. I can't avoid all legal terms. But to invoke responsibility is to hold a state to account for screwing up. So here are our injured states. This is, uh, this is probably customary international law, fairly widely accepted. These are who can normally invoke responsibility. This is your basic straightforward. One state hurts another state. Poor old injured state can invoke responsibility, can hold that state to account. Easy peasy. But not interesting in the R date because if I damage my high seas, what can China do? What happens if there's an environmental disaster in the Arctic? What happens if, even before we get to the stage of a disaster, there's a failure of governance? States are not what we call exercising due diligence. They're not taking adequate care. What can China do about it? China cares about the environment up here. But what measures can they take? Now, they're not an injured state. I'm not going to go through the explanation of this. But it's clear that if Norway doesn't govern its oil and gas operations properly, it doesn't really directly affect China. So what about other states, states that are not injured states, states that are not in the region, states that do not suffer a loss, a material loss? Well, the International Law Commission uh, made a, a set of articles, including this Article 48 that's always been controversial, that sets up the criteria for when other states can invoke responsibility, can hold the wrongful state to account. And this is a very wordy way of saying where we have an obligation in the common interest. Now, part A, 48A, is, uh, I'm trying to avoid the Latin, is uh, obligations in the common interest of a select group of states. So that would normally be under a treaty obligation. Could be regional, customary, international law, very unusual, but it would be uh, under treaty law, states have obligations to one another. And the second is an example where under customary law, states have an obligation to the international community, not just states, but just to the world. So we're talking about when there's a common interest. If there is this kind of common interest, then China can bring a claim. And to bring a claim, what do you do? Well, one of those might be making a, uh, seeking a judicial remedy, and under Law of the Sea Convention, to which China is a party, as are seven Arctic states, there is provisions on compulsory dispute settlement. That means you have to accept the jurisdiction of some court or another. But the other thing they can do is take measures, sometimes called countermeasures. At an extreme level, that might be sanctions. Uh, that's quite a strong word, but we might just talk about suspension of a trade uh, obligation. We might talk about closing ports to certain uh, vessels and so forth. These kind of uh, measures that are more than just um, retortion, more than just unfriendly conduct, like banning your diplomats, but taking a kind of legal measure that would otherwise be, be unlawful. So the potential of this, this Article 48 has always been controversial in international law, but... There's also evidence for this idea that some interests are common interests, that all states have an interest in them. We can see that through the history of, of jurisprudence. 1970, Barcelona Traction, uh, in which the court identified certain interests that because of their seriousness, all states had an interest in. Torture, genocide, really dramatic things. East Timor, 1995, the court revisits that. Uh, and talk about the right of self-determination, something all states have an interest in. But in neither of those cases did the case go to the merits because there was no jurisdiction on other bases. So there had never been a case brought by a state that was not an injured state. There had never been a case brought where a state that was not directly affected had litigated successfully. Are we getting closer? Well, my first question is, we have this narrow group of obligations, these common interest obligations, but is the protection of the marine environment one of them? I'm not sure. But we're closing the gap. 
So the list we have from Barcelona Traction, now 44 years old, is looking at major humanitarian crimes. It's not really looking, and crimes on acts of aggression. It's not looking at uh, um, environmental law. Because in 1970, environmental law was pretty rudimentary. Uh, we hadn't even had the Stockholm Conference. But in 2011, we have the, the Seabed Dispute Chamber of the International Tribunal of Law of the Sea, which is about seabed activity, so not something of obvious relevance in the Arctic, but very important from state responsibility perspective. And the Seabed Dispute Chamber said each state party, each party, each member of the Conventional Law of the Sea, may also be entitled to claim compensation in light of the erga omnis, sorry, there's my Latin, uh, character of the obligations relating to preservation of the environment of the high seas and in the area. So the Seabed Dispute Chamber has said that obligations under the Convention on the Law of the Sea are these special kind of obligations that any state party can bring an action on. That means China can bring an action against any other party to the UNCLOS if it does not uphold its Part 12 environmental obligations. But that's just the Seabed Dispute Chamber. It's not even the whole Tribunal of Law of the Sea. It's an advisory opinion, so technically non-binding, but still extremely influential. But we need to see what's going on elsewhere. So in 2012, for the first time ever, a state successfully brought a case against another state for one of these common interest issues. Does it have anything to do with environmental law or law of the sea? No. It's about torture. Now, this is Mr. Habri, a former dictator of Chad, hiding in Senegal for a decade. Senegal kept faffing about, basically finding any excuse not to prosecute. So after 10 years, Belgium loses its patience and brings the case before the Court of Justice because Senegal would not prosecute Mr. Habre, nor would they extradite him to Belgium. But the interesting thing is, Belgium brought the case claiming that they were an injured state, that they were materially injured because one of the people that Habre tortured or his regime tortured had later become a Belgian citizen. What did the court say? Doesn't matter. You have a right, Belgium, under the Convention Against Torture, just by virtue of being a party to that convention. It's enough to be a party to that convention. And it doesn't matter that you are not materially affected. So you have this common interest standing. And that vote was held on standing 14 to 2. Interestingly, of the two dissented, one was the ad hoc judge for Senegal, so guaranteed to vote with Senegal, and the other was the Chinese judge, Judge Yue. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a very strong precedent for this right in the common interest of states to bring actions. Does it apply in law of the sea? Does it apply in environmental law? Very difficult to say. Torture is a long way from environmental law. But the reasoning, reasoning of the court, which I can, in the second part here, is based on what we call a structural account. It's based on a logical conclusion. That is, if Belgium can't bring this case... If only an injured state can bring a case under Torch Convention, then nobody can bring a case. And if nobody can bring a case, there's no point in having this obligation at all. So if a special interest, if some personal or some state connection to the wrongful act is required to invoke responsibility, in many cases no state would be in a position to make such a claim. We can see how that works with torture, if a state tortures its own citizens. So it follows that, a logical conclusion, any state party to the Convention Against Torture may invoke the responsibility of another state party, with a view to ascertaining the alleged failure to comply with its obligations obligations, back to the Latin, sorry, ergo omnes parties, under the treaty. So what on earth does that mean for the law of the sea? Hard to say. Um, in 2014, in March, we had the whaling judgment. This is a very interesting case for me. Australia takes Japan to court for whaling. What's Australia's interest in whaling? They don't whale. Why does this violate the rights of Australia? It's not clear it does. Japan doesn't contest standing on that basis, so the court doesn't address it. But it does suggest there is a broader acceptance of the rights of states that are not directly effective to bring claims. So what does this mean? Well, as far as I can see, it means that any party to the Convention of Law of the Sea can bring a case against any other party for not upholding its Part 12 environment protection obligations. So China has standing. Probably China can also take countermeasures, that is uh, sort of minor... Uh, suspension of treaty obligations, maybe trade treaties, in protest on the same basis. 
Then we have the question of United States, not a party to uh, the Law of the Sea Convention. If any Americans are here, please get on it, because it makes my life really complicated. But uh, there may also be, on the same reasoning, if we go back to the reasoning of the court, on the same logical basis we could hold that, uh, there would also be the same rights under customary law, but that has yet to be tested. I hope uh, some of you followed some of that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Johnston. Yeah. Uh, now we have uh, the five speakers have finished their presentation. Uh, now it's time for questions and comments. Uh, anyone who wants to uh, raise, oh, okay, please. Any other question can raise your hand, let me know. And then, okay. Yes, uh, my question is to Rachel Johnson. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, first of all, I think about how extremely poorly managed most fish, fish stocks are around the world. And um, I'm thinking about just something like tuna fisheries. Um, I mean, would there be any grounds for like countries, I don't know the right word, suing each other for for poorly managing fish stocks, uh, and if there is grounds, why hasn't it happened? And um, as a political scientist and international relations person listening to your argument, I mean, in international relations, the argument is that, of course, if you have a public good, it will be abused, it will be under investment, etc., etc., and you need a hegemon. The only, per, the only state which has the, the, the power, the strength to, to protect public goods is a hegemonic power. And there's a lot of sometimes self-serving American argument that American hegemony has been beneficial because it has protected international public goods. Um, so of course, drawing on the title of your presentation, I mean, do we basically and now I'm speaking as the political scientist, I mean, do we basically have to wait for a day when China is the hegemon of the international system for China to start protecting international public goods? Thank you. Oh, shall I answer that straight away? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, on fish stocks management, I have to say I'm not an expert on fisheries at all. It's a whole, like, little special field of international law. Um, there is actually a case on uh, tuna, as you mentioned. Tuna is a special case because it's a highly migratory fish. Um, and that case was decided by the ITLOS, the Tribunal of Law of the Sea, uh, brought by Australia and New Zealand against Japan uh, for not uh, protecting the tuna. And it was successful. They got uh, interim measures, so uh, like a temporary stay uh, on the fishing of the tuna. Um, so there is a precedent there. Then it was, didn't go to a full hearing because they then renegotiated and settled, but there is definitely potential for litigation on that. Um, now, New Zealand and Australia were affected states because they had their own tuna fishery. Um, are there, is there potential for non-affected states to bring cases on fisheries management? Yes, on the same basis, but in fisheries cases you would be much more likely to find an injured state because if it's a shared fish stock, then you have clearly a state that's affected by the other state's actions. So in fishing, it's a little bit, um, you're just less likely to have an incident that only affects a common interest and doesn't affect directly a state. So you're going to have an injured state, it's much more likely. Um, on your second question about needing a hegemon to enforce the protection of public goods, I'm not sure. Uh, well, there's lots of reasons states bring actions in international law and lots of reasons they don't bring actions. Um, but just the whaling case, I mean, Australia, Australia is a kind of what, can I even call it a middle power, any Australians here? I mean, it's, it's you know, nice. We like Australia, but why does Australia bring a case against Japan? It brings a case against Japan for domestic political reasons. I don't think even the Australians expected to win it. Um, so I'm not sure that you need to be a hegemon. Uh, certainly uh, the United States can't use the UNCLOS because they're not a party. Uh, China can, but right now wouldn't. I don't. I, I wouldn't expect them to do. But I'm, I'm talking about the long game here. I'm not talking about now. I mean, right now China's playing very nice, nice in the north. They're everybody's friend. They're very respectful of sovereignty and very careful. 
Um, but that can change very quickly. We know how quickly China has already changed in the last 10 years. So there is a potential for China to assert uh, more clearly its interests in the environment in the high north. Um, now, unlike Australia, it's maybe less concerned about domestic opinion, but it's maybe very concerned about its international opinion and its status in the world. So by bringing an action, it's saying we're a big guy and we care up here and we have interests. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I'm not sure that we need, in law at least, we need a hegemon to make these kind of actions. Law is a fairly nice way of dispute resolution. We're not bringing in the, the Navy. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's not always the most effective, and there's lots of other ways that states try and seek remedies. Does that answer? Okay. Questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Njold Wegge, Fritjof Nansen Institute. Uh, thank you for interesting presentations. I have uh, two questions, so one for uh, Sue Leile. So, uh, to what degree uh, would you say there's an expectation or, yeah, an expectation to participate in the future management of the Arctic Ocean high seas? Uh, obviously, for example, Iceland I certainly feel uh, they should have been included, etc. Uh, I'm sure it's not so high on the agenda in the Asian high seas fishing states, but to what degree does it exist, such an expectation? Second question to Heidar Thor Valdrisson. Um, do you know anything about whether or not the snow crab uh, catching in the high seas in the Arctic, for example, the loophole in the, in the Barnes Sea, is regulated or not? Is it just uh, wild west, everyone can fish as much as possible? or? Mm -hmm. Lolly first. Lolly first. Yeah, about the snow crab. Well, it's actually king crab in the Barents Sea. Snow crab is only well. There is no, snow it, crab. It's crab. snow crab in the in the loophole. In the loophole. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. It's it's been uh, fished. I, I don't know about that. Okay. I know I know a little bit about the king crab fishery. Uh, that where where the Russians do manage it actually, but in Norway they more look at it as pest because it is an invasive species and it does really affect the environment. But the Russians and the northern parts of Norway, they are actually have quotas. But the, the more southern parts of Norway, you can, you can probably fish it as you, as you like. So there's an international thing going on there. But, but the queen crab, I, I don't know. I'm, I know a little bit about the queen crab in the, the western Atlantic, but not, not, not there. Thank you, Noid, for your question. And I I'm, I think that you just mentioned about the uh, Arctic high sea. And uh, I just want to mention something, which is the, I think that the latest news about uh, the Arctic five states, they have the conference about uh, kind of fishes management beyond their EEZ, and something concerning about the Arctic high seas fisheries. And also, uh, I think that they, are, they just try to uh, kind of excise a ban for fishing at the Arctic high seas, and there is no agreement. But they are talking about this kind of, this kind of. I think that maybe con uh, agreement or what? Yeah. But I just to think about whether this is the the five Arctic states are privileged or entitled to make such kind of agreement, because I think that the just like the lady has mentioned that the high sea, the resources at the high sea, they are the public goods. And refers to, and belongs to the human beings. I think that if any agreement agreed on for this Arctic high seas, there should get involvement of the non-Arctic states in it. So this is something about my opinions about Arctic high seas. Thank you. Any question? Oh, you're first, and then you're okay. Yeah, I have a question to uh, Tom Barry. Um, your uh, negotiations in China about uh, migrating birds that you just mentioned, uh, whom are your partners in China? Who do you negotiate with? I understand that you are kind of a NGO here uh, and not representing a state, uh, but are you having special partners in China to negotiate with? Uh, no, Thank negotiation you. is perhaps too strong a word because when we're discussing with the Arctic Council, it's a consensus-based forum. 
But uh, as China has just recently been uh, admitted as an observer to the Council, uh, their representatives to the Arctic Council are from their foreign ministry. So it's with those representatives that we now start to discuss how Chinese experts or how Chinese uh, government bodies could perhaps become involved in what we call the Arctic Migratory Bird Initiative. And uh, very many of the other organisations involved in migratory birds conservation see this as uh, a positive step because they're generally dealing with environmental ministries and they see this as a step up in the government sort of hierarchy and potentially a way to enact change at a higher level. So uh, it's just the foreign ministries at the moment that we're in Goshen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting um, presentations. I just had a very quick comment about the question about the Australia <clears throat> Australia Japan uh, dispute over whaling. Uh, just to give a bit of background, um, in the case of Australia, there has been the perception in Australia that the Southern Ocean is, I hesitate to say part of the security zone, but Australia has traditionally seen itself as a conservator of the Southern, uh, the Southern Ocean. And the second point is that uh, New Zealand was a kind of co-plaintiff uh, co to the uh, dispute. New Zealand does uh, have very strong opinions concerning whaling, and it too also tends to view the Southern Ocean as part of, its, uh, part of its area of economic interest. So it also sees itself as a conservator. So there was a bit of um, political prestige on the line in both cases. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Okay. Um, can, I, can I respond briefly to that? Yeah, um, I mean, Australia didn't make a claim as an injured state. It was very unclear what their basis was. Um, they do have a sense of it being their backyard. They also, so they might claim that it's a violation of the whaling convention that specially affects them. So they could paint it as an injured state. They could also have claimed it was in their EEZ of Antarctica, but it was guaranteed that the court would not touch that with the proverbial barge pole. Um, with regard to New Zealand, they're, uh, they're an intervener, but their um, memorial to the court, it's not really a memorial because it's an intervener, but their paper to the court was based on this being, or got on this, based on this being in a common interest. They were not arguing for uh, a particular New Zealand interest uh, in the case. Interestingly, the remedies that Australia sought, which were um, a suspension and a declaration of wrongfulness, we're not the kind of remedies that only injured states can get. They are the kind of remedies that any state claiming in the common interest can claim. So we can't really identify anything. I mean, I went through the whole case and all the memorial and all the written submissions and the oral pleadings, and it's never specified the basis on which they claim. But they're, um, I think it would have been very difficult for them to argue that they were an injured state in that case, unless they were themselves wanting to whale. You know, there's, there's a shared resource, but if the the last thing they want to admit is that wheels are a resource. So. Okay. Any response or question? Okay. Uh, I have a question to Tom about the the working group of the uh, of the Arctic Council versus about the policy making process between the for the, all the between the working group and the Arctic Council's minister level meetings was the relations. And the second about the, because there are six working groups and other groups like uh, system development, like pro pro protection of the mar marine environment, they all have something to do with your, uh, your theme, it's the, the topics of biodiversity protection. So, the so policy coordination of di different working groups. This is my second question. Thank you. Okay, if I understand you correctly, that there are six working groups within the Arctic Council, and each has a di different thematic focus, and each has a different mandate. The group that I work with, CAF, it's the biodiversity group, so its focus is to report and assess on uh, and advise on what's happening with regards to changes in biodiversity in the Arctic. So, in, of these six working groups, there are two science groups that sit on that divide between policy and science. There's uh, the group CAF, and there's also the Arctic Assessment and our Monitoring and Assessment Program, who are a contaminants-based organisation. Uh, what we do is we sit in that divide between large groups of scientists who, through our monitoring and assessment programmes, deliver these very detailed, complicated technical reports. And then our task is to take these reports and through in a way simplify them or transform them into a form that policymakers can better understand. 
that we then present to the senior Arctic officials within the Arctic Council, and in turn that goes to the Arctic uh, or the foreign ministers of the Arctic states, where we present them with uh, recommendations based on the science work that's conducted through the groups, identifying potential actions or responses they can take when they develop policy. Uh, I hope that answers. Okay, uh, according to the rule of the organizer, uh, I, as a moderator, I'm, I have the right to raise a question for the... <laughs> okay, I, I want to raise a question for, for Tom, for the CAFF. I think the future, uh, China scientists, <coughs> especially on the field of your, your, your working group, will join the team work in, in your in CAF. So uh, you are the executive secretary. Uh, in your opinion, what kind of role, if a China scientist working in your group, what, she, what kind of role he will play, he should play? What kind of role as maybe the bridge of the C CFF and China? And uh, what kind of role? Not the <laughs> okay, well, I can give you an example. <coughs> uh, the, the Council recently released through, through the CAF Working Group the first assessment of biodiversity in the Arctic. And uh, that involved well over 250 scientists. But many of those scientists were not Arctic scientists. They were scientists from spread across the globe. So, and they led chapters. They developed the uh, synthesis of information and the recommended conservation actions and all of these sort of issues. Have, they, have any uh, scientists already participated in some work or not? Uh, from China? Uh, not yet. But we've actually just received the first submission of data from... Uh, uh, a Chinese institute uh, dealing with uh, migratory birds. Okay. So, so we haven't yet actually uh, engaged with, uh, there was no Chinese scientists involved in that particular work. But where the dividing line is, is that the Arctic states reserve for themselves the right to develop the policy recommendations, or recommendations that are impact upon policy. So uh, observer countries, they're very welcome to involve themselves in the scientific aspects of the work and the development of those scientific recommendations. But then, uh, sort of, that divide comes when it comes to considering policy issues. Yes, I, I, I like to convey your message to the, the future uh, yeah. scientists. <laughs> yeah, I would be very happy to uh, have uh, Chinese uh, experts contact us. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments? No. Uh, Thank you, all the uh, speakers and all the questions and comments uh, for your contribution. Now, in this session is over. Now I'm going to uh, transit my the chair to the uh, the last session, the closing remarks. I will ask to uh, thank you for all the speakers. I think the, uh, Mr. Jia, uh, head of the strategic study division from a PRIC. Uh, and also the Deputy Director of CNAC, and also the uh, IGLO uh, from the Minister of the Nordic Cooperation. You can sit here to say the close remarks here. <laughs> okay. I can sit here. Okay. It's your own floor, it's yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for giving me uh, this uh, uh, opportunity to make a, a brief uh, a closing speech on behalf of CNAC. It's, uh, it's delightful to spend the meaningful and valuable two days with, uh, with over 15 experts and scholars from Nordic country and the China Institute, institutors in beautiful Aquileli. So it's the second time we, uh, we get together uh, this seminar. Is, uh, Aquileli is the first one since uh, CNAC established on December 2000, 2013. CNAC has, uh, has three uh, primary activities. One is holding, uh, holding seminars. Uh, such as the second uh, symposium. And the other is exchange scholars uh, program that's now being implemented. Third is writing. 
is writing books uh, jointly. So all these activities work for one goal, to enhance the knowledge of the Arctic and improve the multi-understanding and cooperation in academic field. I could not make a full conclusions on all the reports in such a short time. Maybe let's leave this, this work to the, the third issues of a newsletter. The Arctic region and the whole world, not only the climate and the ecosystem uh, link together, through the resource exploitation and the transportation business, the interaction of the economic system also shows the trend to be more close. This is a dynamic policy issue of the Arctic region governance and also provide a new chance to strengthen the Arctic policy research and cooperation between China and the Nordic country. Luckily, CNAC uh, will serve as an active uh, bridge for this kind of cooperation. We may be a bit uh, uh, tired after the two of intensive communication and report, but uh, obviously, we get another efficient achievement. We met and become acquaintance, and now we are friends. Maybe after a several several symposiums, we we maybe we we maybe we could be a close friends. So 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 I think it's it, it's the most effective achievement. Well. At this moment, I would like to express my truly gratitude. I sincerely appreciate President uh, President Song to uh, come to the meeting in person, uh, give us an excellent uh, uh, speech. I have many thanks to the host, the Iceland Research Center, and the Sosten. And I thank you for all your hard work to. Uh, ensure this meeting successfully. Many thanks to the support from the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Nord Folk. Many thanks to the support from the Nordic Council of Minister uh, of CINA, uh, all members of the delegates of the CINAC. And thanks a lot uh, to the, all the experts and the scholars who come to this seminar. You are the greatest contribute. Finally, I will don't forget to say, maybe on behalf of SRIS, uh, 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 yesterday uh, the 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 sampler, uh, the 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 the, the sampler decide next uh, next meeting is held. Uh, in Shanghai next year. So, so, so maybe I can see, uh, see you again in Shanghai. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Is everyone still awake? I hope you enjoyed your days here in Akurere. It's one of our most beautiful towns, and the people are wonderful. And I think the food is really good also. So I hope you agree with me. But I would like to thank you very much for the invitation to come here and speak uh, at this second China Nordic Arctic Co Cooperation Symposium. I am here as the Minister for Nordic Cooperation, representing the of official Nordic Governmental Cooperation, the Nordic Council of Ministers. Do you know anything about that? Some are, not, <laughs> are nodding in their head. So, uh, well, I hope it, was, it won't bother you that I'll go through a little bit of information about uh, what we actually do. 
as, as you probably all know, uh, the Nordic countries are five countries, and no, as well as uh, f uh, three independent uh, well, lands or, or areas. Uh, it's uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, uh, including, uh, of course, then the Faroe Islands, uh, Greenland, and Orland. And since we're talking about the Arctic, all the Nordic countries are defined as Arctic states. And uh, so the reason for that is, of course, because geographically, a large part of the Nordic land and sea areas are located in the north, in the Arctic area. So uh, we tend to be heavily involved in matters uh, regarding the Arctic. There, you've all been discussing in these couple of days the major changes that are happening in this area with consequences, challenges, and opportunities for the four million people living there. And it's important for us to actually talk about the people because we do tend to talk so much, much about maritime issues, about the climate change, about the environmental issues, but we might not talk as much about the people that actually live there, four million people that live in the Arctic area. And that's um, what uh, Nordic Cooperation has always been most concerned about. It's the people. What we can do to make sure that people have a better life in the area where they are. Um, we have been quite successful in, in that way. Uh, the Nordic region was recently called the next supermodel, when competed with China in that case. Uh, by the renowned magazine The Economist, and that referred to our efforts on promoting green growth and sustainable welfare societies for our people. And so we believe that we have a lot to offer. Uh, regarding a little bit of information about what we do, the Nordic Council of Ministers is, is what is called the Nordic Governmental Cooperation. We were established in 1971 and we have an annual budget of 130 million euros. We consist of not only the ministers of Co Nordic Cooperation, but 11 councils of ministers with specific policy areas, such as research, education, environment, business, and health. We have several, some say too many, Nordic institutions and working groups where Arctic issues are increasingly relevant. The Nordic Prime Ministers and the Foreign Ministers regularly discuss Arctic issues and it is on the Prime Minister's agenda at their meeting now uh, that was held in late June that will be held. Um, we also have uh, a cooperation between our parliaments, uh, the Nordic Council, which is an official uh, inter-parliamentary body in the Nordic region, and they also have regular sessions concerning Arctic issues. Uh, most recently in, in Reykjavik in 2012. Uh, so it's also very high on our uh, parliamentary lists. And we are working on a new RA cooperation program uh, from 2015. We are an observer organization to Arctic Council since 1996, and we have promoted a strong Arctic Council. We intend and we do stand to uh, face the same challenges in the future. To cooperate on the Nordic level also opens up possibilities for the countries to exchange experiences and contribute to the social innovation in the Nordic regions. We need to do that because we have um, common issues such as aging population, education and competence building, welfare, the environment, and business, and these are all very important components of the Nordic cooperation. For example, a major challenge that uh, the, all the Nordic countries are facing is a youth un unemployment, which was uh, a theme, a specific theme for the uh, Prime Minister's minute meeting uh, last summer, and we have been making some concrete measures to combat un unemployment among young people. There are, as you know so very well, much better than I do actually, I'm sure, uh, there are certain what we call megatrends in the Arctic area. And um, many of the hundreds of projects that the 
uh, Nordic Council of Ministers has financed since 1996. Uh, spending approximately 70 million euros have been focusing on these issues, issues that people in the Arctic are dealing with every day. The democratic challenges uh, that the people are facing are scary in some way. Um, it's a matter of high concern. There's a decline in birth rates, which leads to the reduction of number of people in the active workforce. Women are leaving. And that, as I mentioned, the general aging has res result to the general aging of the population. More women leave than men. And this, of course, has a negative effect on both social life and economy through opportunities for marriage, maintenance of family life and family relations, as well as through the loss of educational skills. We think it is very important to approach this in a holistic way. We need to promote education and skills development, create jobs and promote a sustainable welfare model in the Arctic to meet these challenges. We also need to generate what we call so nicely uh, human capital. Um, we need to invest in our people. And that's also a way to actually get the women back. We need to make sure that we um, enhance the human skill and talent that we already have there, and also that we create the jobs that are necessary to, to keep the people there. Education has a major role in that aspect, and Nordic cooperation is especially strong when it comes to education and skills development for the people. You have already, like I mentioned, discussed uh, pollution and climate change, and Nordic cooperation has proved quite successful in international climate and environmental processes. We uh, I think all of us recognize that uh, global climate change and changes in the Arctic are not only an issue for the people that live there, but it's an international issue that we all need to deal with. That's why we are here. And we, uh, the Nordic environmental ministers, cooperate on reducing short-lived climate forces, which have an impact on melting uh, of the ice in the Arctic. We have a declaration from the Svalbard uh, in 2012 which has uh, stated, as you know, ambitious goals for reducing the emissions of black carbon and methane. So we have supported uh, wood stove initiatives with concrete measures to decrease black carbon emissions from residential heating, which is one of the main sources for black carbon emissions in the Arctic. When we come back also to uh, the impact on the people, uh, the accumulation of mercury and heavy metal in eatable fish is a very serious issue. Research has shown that pregnant women who are exposed to high quantities of mercury may give birth to children with damages to the central nervous system. And we have contributed actively by financing and negotiation meetings and background information on regulating the use of mercury, which led to the binding UN Declaration on Mercury from 2013. Iceland has the presidency of the Nordic Council this year, and one of the, the main projects or the focus of our presidency is a project called the Bioeconomy. And the aim of this project, the Bioeconomy, is that we use our natural resources in a better way. We have um, a cross sectorial, holistic, again, approach uh, with our initiatives. Uh, with bioeconomy. Uh, there's a specific uh, focus on bioeconomy in the Arctic, focusing on food security and access to traditional foods. We're also now working on realizing the full potential of bioeconomy, including value creation and business opportunities to ensure uh, smart green growth in the Nordic region. There are many more uh, initiatives and projects that I could mention that we are working on. Uh, in the end, I would specifically like to mention that we have been working uh, on a um, large-scale joint um, Nordic initiative on Arctic research, which is starting from 2014. It's a cross-sectorial research initiative taking uh, 
like I said, a sectoral holistic approach to the changes, challenging and opportunities in the Arctic. And to support the establishment of an international, multidisciplinary Nordic Center of Excellence, Nordforsk, which is one of our institutes, is issuing a call for proposals for planning uh, grants. The 10 best proposals will be awarded um, 100,000 Norwegian kronas, not Icelandic ones, uh, to develop full proposal for Nordic Centers of Excellence. And the deadline for the submission of proposals for planning grants do you have your pen? The 5th of June, uh, 2014, so you have some time. And of course then we have a, an open call for full proposals for Nordic Centers of Excellence in, will be issued in early autumn 2014. And we expect to, to allocate a total of 90 million uh, Norwegian crones from Nordforsk and Nordic countries for the, for the initiative from 2014 to 2018. So we're not only talking about this, but we're also putting our money where our mouth is. So that's important, because this is important for us. We have also been working with the Baltic states, uh, which is quite extensive, and the same goes for cooperation with Russia, which is also widely spread. We're also looking to the West, working with Canada, and, um, and so we have regular meetings uh, with uh, the four regional councils of the north, Barnes Euro Arctic Council, Council of the Baltic Sea States, and the Arctic Council in order to exchange knowledge and ideas for cooperation. I would like to emphasize that I truly believe that uh, Nordic cooperation holds great potential uh, as we share ma so many of the same challenges and opportunities in the future in the region as a whole, as well as in the Arctic. We should all of us then work together in order to promote the well-being of the people living here in the Arctic to stimulate a sustainable economic development and the exploitation of natural resources with respect for nature and to work continuously for the development of a modern welfare societies in the Arctic for the people, once again. Because we would like to keep the Nordic as heavily populated as we possibly can. I don't think we're aiming for China. Uh, I don't think we'll ever manage that. But um, there's a lot of opportunities. There's also a lot of threats. And we need to be able to deal with that. And I believe we could do that best through cooperation between the Nordic countries and also with other countries, as I've mentioned. And of course, I also believe that China should be one of the cooperating partners in the way we develop, um, the way we approach this issue. So thank you so much for your attention. On behalf of the organizers uh, here, I would like to thank uh, Minister for Nordic Cooperation, Eglo Haraldotir, for her excellent and encouraging closing words. Um, um, and I would also like to use the opportunity to thank you all, presenters and organizers, for your uh, kind contribution and good contribution, and uh, uh, I would uh, just to let you know that uh, all of the presentations, they have been uh, recorded, so they will be available on the web in due time, unless some authors would protest that they would be made uh, open and available. 
but we will let you know in due time when this becomes available on the web. And um, uh, I would uh, also like to use the opportunity to thank especially the people that have been so instrumental in all the uh, sort of the service here to make the, to prepare or make this happen and I would like uh, Ingveldur, Deng Basi and uh, Guðrún Rosa and Embla if you just stand up and uh, so we can thank you. And uh, finally, you need to get out of here and to your home and have your safe trip home. And uh, there will be a bus leaving uh, from here to Hotel Kea. And uh, those of you who want to go directly to the airport, you can also take the bus to there. Uh, there is a flight, I know, leaving at 6.40, so it's in a good time for that. So, uh, on behalf of the organizer, I wish you, organizers, I wish you all safe trip and hope to see you all in Shanghai in one year's time. I think they are, <laughs> there are I'm going some to... here. Ingvaldur, is there are? No, I know here. I don't know if there are. Power office. Yeah, what? Uh, power office uh, is green. Oh, when I do this coffee, <laughs> coffee things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it's not a need for to break it. Is that possible? Yeah, can I copy uh, CPT uh, with my USB or I need to write uh, the article about it? Yes, yes. Yeah. So you want to copy everything or? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, wait, wait. Hello, Ingvaldur. Yeah. Sevilla, Pao. Þeir vilja fá að taka sko kópíur af erindunum. Because we don't know if there is someone that would, you know, rather have it in a PDF file. 
because this is what we have. Yeah, I, I, but, um, so, uh, but, uh, I, 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 think, I, I think we should at least, uh, because Teng Beisi is yeah. working for the senior, okay. so at least he should yes, have yes. the permission to do it. And then, of course, when the uh, recording is on yeah, the web, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but I got a bit, you know, um, <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was. But, but if you, I, you. <laughs> permit, then it's your yeah. responsibility. Yes, yes, so you have to on it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can. Yeah. Uh, I write for several 
ですよ。Is it in Chinese or in English? Yeah, in no. Chinese. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>